to Abdul, his wife, and his three young daughters. We want you to be able to get to the airport, contact us, we'll see whatever we can do to get you there. We've got to get you out. We are committed to deal with you, your wife, and your child to get all three of you out of Afghanistan. That's the commitment. That is what the president told our Stephanie Ramos, passing along a message from an Afghan translator tonight. But the reality on the ground in Kabul is far different. 15,000 Americans and up to 60,000 Afghans and their families struggling to escape Afghanistan. The U.S. hoping to get 6,000 people out today. But a major question, where to send them? The U.S. air base in Qatar at capacity. As we first reported last night, some Americans are being turned away at checkpoints, reports of the Taliban beating some Americans as well. And, you know, I actually got whacked with, um, you know, with one of these, like, you know, fan belts for not moving fast enough. Our Ian panel in Kabul tonight, Martha Raddatz in Washington. The major storm barreling toward New England tonight and hurricane warnings in the New York City metro area for the first time in a decade. What communities need to be on high alert tonight and will the weekend be a washout? Our Rob Marciano times it all out. The major Delta surge tonight. The U.S. recording nearly 158,000 new COVID cases in just 24 hours. Its highest single case total in nearly seven months. Also a new milestone tonight in the race to vaccinate more than 200 million Americans with at least one dose. And the major backlash tonight after controversial comments by Texas's Lieutenant Governor falsely claiming African Americans are driving the COVID surge in Texas. The Tesla bot is coming. The big announcement today about the humanoid, but when it might actually become a reality and what will it be used for? And the all Afghan girls robotics team made international headlines several years ago. Some members now being evacuated tonight after a major team effort. What's next for the group? And what about the members of the team who are still in Afghanistan tonight? And the reality is, is that there's going to be millions and millions of women that are going to remain in the country that, you know, deserve our protection. Good evening, everyone. I'm Phil Lipoff in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Tonight, there is a major tropical threat barreling toward the East Coast. We will have the latest track on that in just a few minutes, but we want to begin again in Afghanistan. Scenes of desperate crowds outside the airport walls again today as inside the airport progress grinded to a halt with reports the U.S. airbase in Qatar is at capacity. ABC News confirming flights stopped for up to seven hours. Tonight, President Biden citing significant progress in the evacuation, saying 5,700 evacuees left the country today and some 13,000 since the weekend. And when questioned about the Americans unable to get to the airport, he said he has, quote, no indication that is happening. However, our firsthand accounts on the ground in Kabul are different than the administration's messaging. We heard that last night from David Fox, who said he was prevented from getting to the airport and then briefly beaten by the Taliban with a rubber belt. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin did call reports of Americans being harassed and beaten by the Taliban unacceptable. Our Ian Panel leads us off again tonight from Kabul. Tonight, the desperation in Kabul captured in the single shocking image of a baby being lifted over razor wire handed to a U.S. Marine. Officials now confirming the baby's been safely reunited with his father at the airport. This as a young girl begs U.S. troops to let her in. I got a hand for me! <laughs> Thousands still waiting outside the gates, where Taliban fighters rule the streets. Nearly 6,000 U.S. troops now guarding the airport. Tonight, ABC News confirming there were no U.S. flights out of Kabul for up to seven hours today because the airbase in Qatar was filled to capacity. They're saying that they don't have enough room over there. The women and the kids, everyone has problems. And... They're sleeping on the, on the street right now. Late today, we've learned rescue flights have now resumed, diverted to other locations. U.S. officials say 5,700 people have been evacuated in the last 24 hours, including hundreds of Americans, 13,000 in all since Saturday. Tonight, President Biden insisting the U.S. is doing everything it can to rescue those who want to get out, but acknowledging the extreme dangers involved. Any American who wants to come home, we will get you home. But make no mistake, this evacuation mission is dangerous. I cannot promise 
what the final outcome will be or what it will be that it will be without risk of loss. For the first time, the Pentagon today saying it'll rescue Americans outside the airport, quote, if there's a need. But today, the president's own State Department issued this new travel alert, reiterating the U.S. government cannot ensure safe passage to the airport. Our Stephanie Ramos pressing the president about getting Americans to safety. The military has secured the airport, as you mentioned, but will you sign off on sending U.S. troops into Kabul to evacuate Americans who haven't been able to get to the airport safely? We have no indication that they haven't been able to get in Kabul through the airport. We've made an agreement with the, with the Taliban thus far. They've allowed them to go through. It's in their interest for them to go through. So we know of no circumstance where American citizens are carrying an American passport or trying to get through to the airport. But we will do whatever needs to be done to see to it they get to the airport. Despite the president saying he's no indication there have been difficulties getting to the airport, <laughs> for several nights now, we've reported on the violence and terror outside Kabul airport and Americans and Afghans who can't get through. <laughs> and late today, after the president spoke, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin acknowledging with lawmakers that there have been instances of the Taliban beating Americans trying to get to the airport in Kabul, calling the situation unacceptable. And Pentagon spokesperson John Kirby acknowledging there have been reports of some Americans unable to pass through checkpoints. American citizen David Fox telling ABC News he was unable to make it through the violent crowds to get to the airport safely, even hit by a Taliban fighter. I actually got whacked with, um, you know, with one of these like, you know, fan belts for not moving fast enough. For me as a, as a father, I always have to risk, in, you know, I have to weigh the risks of these different options. So to me, the, the airport is very dangerous. <laughs> And it's not just the thousands of Americans. What about the tens of thousands of Afghans who helped America? The president was pressed. Will you make the same commitment to those who assisted in the American war effort over the last 20 years? Yes, we're making the same commitment. There's no one more important than bringing American citizens out. I acknowledge that. But they're equally important almost as all those who, those SIVs we call them, who in fact helped us. They were translators. They went into battle with us. They were part of the operation. But tonight, six days after Kabul fell, most who are eligible to leave trapped in terrifying limbo with no immediate way to get out. And Ian Panel joins us now. Ian, you're hearing reports of Taliban fighters actually threatening Afghans who helped coalition forces. What do we know about that tonight? Yeah, I mean, there have been multiple reports from different agencies, investigative bodies, humanitarian organizations, uh, that there have been reprisal attacks, that people have been targeted for who they are and for the jobs that they did. But we've also been able to drill down and get hold of a copy of a letter that purports to be from the Islamic, uh, uh, from uh, this, basically from the Taliban, uh, sent to certain people saying, we've identified you as having worked uh, with U.S. forces and therefore Therefore, you are wanted by the Taliban. And we know that some people have been picked up. We personally know of at least one interpreter uh, who had worked together with U.S. military forces on the ground who has had the Taliban at his house, has had to go into hiding. I also know of a good journalist friend, an Afghan here, who's also had the Taliban at his doorstep. So despite what the Taliban have said publicly, there are certainly groups within the Taliban that appear to be deliberately targeting those people involved involved uh, with the Afghan military, with the Afghan police, uh, intelligence, but also those that they see as having uh, connived with what they regard as the occupation forces, and they've been going after them. And that's why you've got this climate of fear. That's why you see those scenes of desperation on the ground. Oh, it has to be so terrifying for so many there, Ian. From what you can see on the ground, can this evacuation crisis that the world is watching get any better without more direct cooperation between the U.S. and the Taliban? And what are the odds of that happening? happening. That, that is the, the question really right now. Um, 
with all the will in the world, war, with all the best efforts of the U.S. military, the U.S. Air Force, who are doing a great job, we can hear the planes taking off, uh, and they are rescuing people. Don't underestimate the power of what, what they're actually doing there. But unless you can get more people through the gates, then this process is going to be dragged on. And because the security situation here in Kabul is so fluid at the moment, uh, and we're talking about some of these reprisal attacks, then there are obviously dangers that some of those people who are eligible to get on the planes will never be able to because they'll be targeted by the Taliban. We've been told for days now that there are talks, there are co there is cooperation between the Taliban and the U.S. military, but it doesn't seem to be producing results on the ground. Again, the president gave a, a lot of lip service to the fact that there was this co cooperation taking place. He didn't see that there were any issues for American passport holders to get there, but the, the truth is there are huge issues. We've spoken to Americans uh, on ABC News Live Prime who've told us exactly that, that they've gone there with their American passports, uh, with their permanent residency, and they've been beaten back by the Taliban. Uh, Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin has also reconfirmed that that has happened as well. John Kirby, Pentagon spokesman, has also doubled down saying, yes, we know that there have been instances of people not being able to get through. That is a reality. More cooperation. We're told that uh, there is a movement of Taliban from Kandahar to Kabul to try and and assert some level of control, and perhaps the situation will improve. But we've been hearing that things are going to get better for days, and on the ground, it just hasn't. Ian Panel from Afghanistan again, thank you. And now to President Biden's promise to that interpreter who helped U.S. forces. You heard Stephanie Ramos ask him about it at the top of the show. The president promised that, quote, we will get you out. But Martha Raddatz has more on that promise and the messy evacuation. Among the thousands of Afghans trying to escape tonight is an interpreter named Abdul. He and his family were already in hiding when we visited Kabul two months ago, and he was already pleading for help. I know that I will be killed by the Taliban. If they take over of the Kabul, directly they will come and they, they will behead us or will, they will kill us. Abdul worked with U.S. Marines in Helmand province. He showed us his visa application, his letters of referral from Marines for whom he risked his life. But now Abdul is on the run with his family, sending us photos, which we will not show, of the Taliban arriving at one of the homes he had just left. Our Stephanie Ramos taking his case straight to the president. My colleague Martha Raditz interviewed Abdul, an interpreter who was on the front lines with U.S. forces in Afghanistan. Overnight, we received a photo of Taliban militants coming to the door of his home, literally hunting him down. Thankfully, he was able to escape, but he is obviously still in mortal danger. What would be your message to Abdul, his wife, and his three young daughters? We want you to be able to get to the airport, contact us. We'll see whatever we can do to get you there. We've got to get you out. We are committed to deal with you, your wife, and your child to get all three of you out of Afghanistan. That's the commitment. Abdul was warning all the way back in June what could happen if the Taliban took over Kabul. And it turns out last month, a U.S. embassy employee sent a classified cable to the State Department predicting the Afghan government could soon collapse. Still, President Biden insists his team did not believe the Taliban would take over so quickly when the Americans pulled out. Americans out. All kinds of cables, all kinds of advice. I made the decision. The buck stops with me. I took the consensus opinion. The consensus opinion was that, in fact, it would not occur if it occurred until later in the year. For more now, we bring in Martha Raddatz. Martha, President Biden now committing to help those Afghans who helped the U.S. get out of the country, including Abdul and his family. Were you able to reach him for a response? Uh, he, he was pleased to see that message to President Biden, but he is worried about all of the interpreters, all of the Afghans. But he did say he had a message for America. He said Afghans worked shoulder to shoulder with Americans and had done their job with honesty and pride, saying the Americans left us behind and left us to those people who are not human and cut our heads off in front of our family. I am a soldier, he said. I am ready to die, but I care for my family. 
if the Taliban captures me, I will say with pride, I will tell them I was an interpreter and did it for my country and my people. And of course, there are continuing efforts to try to get Abdul and his family out of Afghanistan. It's a strong and powerful message. Martha Raddatz, thank you. And Stephanie Ramos joins us now. Stephanie, the president has taken an awful lot of heat for his handling of the withdrawal. And his press conference today, where you pressed him, certainly didn't help him much. That's exactly right, Phil. We are hearing mixed messages. You heard from the president where he said Americans aren't necessarily having a difficult time getting to the Kabul airport. However, we also heard from the Pentagon and the Department of Defense saying that some Americans are being beaten by the Taliban. And we pressed the White House on this uh, late this afternoon, uh, shortly after the president's remarks. And this is what one White House official told me on background, quote, it is a volatile situation on the ground. We are working to to facilitate safe passage for American citizens and SIV applicants and their families to the airport and onto other places. There are going to be reports of challenge and chaos at the airport. Secretary Austin referred to that in the Hill briefing today, but we are going to get Americans into the Kabul airport and on planes. So not necessarily a direct answer, but bottom line, what Congress heard today from the Secretary of Defense speaks for itself, Phil. Stephanie Ramos questioning the president today. Stephanie, thank you. Now to the major storm headed to the East Coast, Henri. Tonight, flash flood watches and storm surge warnings are set to take effect this weekend. It's been 10 years since parts of the New York metro area have been under a hurricane watch, 30 years since New England has seen a direct hit from a hurricane. Rob Marciano joins us now. Rob, time this storm out for us, if you will, and what's the latest track? Well, Phil, you mentioned the watches, and well, now we have warnings up for much of southern New England and Long Island. That means that hurricane conditions are likely in the next 36 hours. Let's show you the extent of this. this is a densely populated area, a lot of uh, complicated infrastructure here. So this could see uh, be a very damaging storm when you have this many warnings and watches up. Watches, hurricane watches all the way to Cape Cod, tropical storm watches all the way to New York City. Uh, the storm itself is expected to continue to strengthen to become a moderate uh, Category 1 storm as it passes over the Gulf Stream during the day tomorrow and then rapidly getting to Long Island and uh, southern New England on Sunday, potentially making landfall as a Category 1 storm, and then slowing down as it goes through Hartford and then uh, dissipating somewhat as it heads through the rest of New England. As far as the impacts from this, as we show you one of our computer models, we'll see high rip, rip currents uh, across the entire Atlantic seaboard. But as this thing rips in through uh, eastern Long Island and Rhode Island and Cape Cod and Connecticut, we'll see winds over hurricane strength, and that will bring down some trees and some power lines. Rain up to 10 inches. Coastal flooding, yes, with a storm surge, especially east of that center, up to five feet. Uh, but what I'm really concerned about is the amount of rainfall that we will see, not just along the coast, but well inland. Uh, we saw a lot of rain with Fred in eastern uh, New England, and we had a very wet July. So I think this is going to do much more than just slam the coast with high winds and could be a high impact storm for millions of Americans. Phil? We know you'll be keeping a close eye on it for us. Rob, thank you. And now to the coronavirus pandemic, the U.S. recording its worst day in nearly seven months, nearly 158,000 new COVID cases in just 24 hours. And late breaking reporting tonight from the New York Times about just how soon we could see full approval of the Pfizer vaccine. Our Marcus Moore reports. Tonight, the New York Times reporting the FDA is aiming to give full approval to the Pfizer COVID vaccine, possibly as soon as Monday. Authorities have indicated for some time full authorization is coming and their hope that if and when it comes, it will encourage more Americans who are hesitant to get their first shot to help stop the Delta variant sweeping the country. It comes as hospitals across the U.S. are in crisis mode, scrambling to find beds to treat a growing crush of COVID patients. It's increasingly younger and largely unvaccinated. I watched a 28-year-old previously healthy unvaccinated patient die from COVID complications. And while we value every life, that's, that one was tough because it could have been prevented. Avery Mitchell is two years old and one of 28 children being cared for at Mississippi's only children's hospital. That's the most they've seen since the beginning of the pandemic. In Florida, Tony Peters struggling to breathe from her hospital bed, now urging others to get their shots. For yourself, for your family, for your loved ones, get the vaccine. 
Also from Florida, this striking image of sick COVID patients lying on the floor of a state-run Regeneron clinic waiting for monoclonal antibody treatments. Toma Dean, seen in that picture, speaking to us today. If I had chose to stand up in line, I'd have never made it to the treatment. I'd have been back at an ER. So I laid on the floor until they got wheelchairs over. And across the country, Oregon now reporting a six-fold increase in hospital patients in the last month. 18 months into this pandemic, our frontline healthcare workers that have been caring for patients every day are exhausted. And we're in a pandemic that many of us regard at this time as largely preventable. Marcus Moore with us now from Dallas. Marcus, there's a new report out there tonight that those fighting for their lives as they battle COVID could have to pay for those hospital bills alone. Yeah, Phil, a, a new preliminary survey of two of the largest private health plans in each state, including Washington, D.C., uh, found that more than 70 percent of them will no longer waive out-of-pocket costs for COVID treatment, and that's expected to happen by the end of this month. Phil. Marcus, thank you. And staying in Texas for a moment, we want to address something Texas Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick said on Fox News last night. We're coming after your state uh, really quickly here and as a response, coming after your state yes. because the increased COVID numbers, hospitalizations, deaths are up in Texas. Uh, and there's a direct assault on your governor's policies and your state's policies. Yeah. Very brief response. Yeah. Well, Laura, the, the COVID is spreading, particularly uh, most of the numbers are with the unvaccinated, and the Democrats like to blame Republicans on that. Well, the biggest group in most states are African Americans who have not been vaccinated. The last time I checked, over 90% of them vote for Democrats in their major cities and major counties. So it's up to the Democrats to get, just as it's up to Republicans, to try to get as many people vaccinated. OK, so let's take a look at that statement, break it down. We've heard this called the pandemic of the unvaccinated. So let's take a look at the data who hasn't gotten shots. While it's true that black Americans as a group are less likely to have gotten vaccinated than white Americans, white Americans still account for the largest share of the country's unvaccinated. Adults, 58 percent, while just 10 percent of unvaccinated adults in the U.S. are black. That's according to CDC data. And a bigger disparity appears to exist based on political party. 58 percent of Republicans say they will not get vaccinated compared to just 15 percent of Democrats. That's according to 538. When we come back, the investigation into the mysterious deaths of three family members out in California. Could they have been killed by toxic algae? Our partners at Nat Geo join us to talk about their look into the cheetah trafficking industry. Yes, that is a thing. But up next, three days into the R. Kelly trial, where do things stand tonight? Stay with us. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Right now, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week with George the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. 
This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're gonna move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into the bomb this. shelter. Run, urgent delivery, run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Now to the long-awaited criminal trial of R&B superstar R. Kelly in the New York federal court. We aren't permitted to broadcast the trial, but ABC News consultant Brian Buckmeyer and his team at the Law and Crime Network have been watching it all from the court's closed video feed. Brian joins us now uh, to help us break it all down. Brian, thank you. My pleasure, Phil. Thank you for having me. All right, so let's start with a quick reminder for folks who haven't been tied to this case like you. Uh, what are the New York federal charges against R. Kelly? So the federal charges are racketeering, specifically of the RICO Act, that's racketeer influence and corrupt organization. And there's some underlying charges associated with that, kidnapping, bribery, forced labor, sex trafficking. And then you also have the Mann Act. Now the Mann Act goes back to 1910, which basically says that you are not allowed to transport any girls or women for the purpose of any immoral act, debauchery, or for any for sexual gratification or pleasure in that sense. So the, those are the main charges he's facing and some of the underlying ones as well. Uh, very serious charges. So can you tell us what happened today? So today we saw at least two witnesses take the stand. First was one of his, his runners, as they call them, or kind of like a manager. He spoke about some of the details connecting the dots for the prosecution, how he would transport girls who looked very young. He, he didn't just say 18, 17. He said they looked even younger than that and how they had to follow certain rules, not just the girls, but he himself. If a girl wanted to eat, uh, wanted to leave a certain room, if he saw a girl walking through the halls, he would have to ask her what she is doing and then make sure to reaffirm that R. Kelly or someone else gave them permission. We also saw the cross-examination of that person as well. And he was talking about, on cross-examination at least, um, how this is so unique. He's worked for Jay-Z, he's worked for Kanye West, he's worked for, uh, for Taylor Swift. But once he crossed through that gate, his words were that it was like the twilight zone, something very different. We heard opening statements earlier this week, of course, as you talked about, and an accuser's testimony. What for you have been the most compelling moments of the first days of this trial? Yeah. So everyone, I think, is walking into this trial believing that if there are so many accusers, there must be some level of truth. And so the surprising part for me is the defense's argument, how the defense is combating this, not necessarily disagreeing that he had sexual relations with these individuals, but trying to paint that these were, quote unquote, the word even came out, groupies or, or, or insinuating they're stalkers following R. Kelly. It was very peculiar for them to come out and call him a victim, but you can see how they're trying to weave that narrative. Now, it's going to be very hard to call an international pop star or a rock star, as they refer to him, as the victim when it comes to the uh, sexual gratification of minors and, and, and the assault allegations. But that's what's surprising to me, how they're trying to create that narrative. Yeah, so just to follow up on that narrative, we're hearing the prosecution's case right now. Obviously, the defense will present its case in the coming days. Uh, but from the opening statement and the cross-examinations that you've been able to witness, are you getting a sense of exactly how how R. Kelly plans to defend himself? Absolutely. It's a, it's a very interesting te technique that a lot of defense attorneys use when the facts are not on your side and they fit so perfectly uh, the elements of a crime, and that goes to the benefit of the prosecution. Here, I think what the defense is trying to do, which I've only seen in, in law school discussions or in, in cases uh, where we kind of discuss them as students, He's trying to make the argument that, well, yes, this is statutory rape, having sex with a minor uh, is a crime, that he was somehow bamboozled, somehow fooled, somehow targeted by these women who lied and showed fake IDs, 
One of the major points that I saw was with the first Jane Doe who testified, drawn to Pace, when they brought in the settlement agreement, where she, along with her mother, signed, saying that she told R. Kelly that she was 19 and provided an ID that said that she was 19. Now, that's not a defense under the law. It's strict liability if you have sex or any kind of sexual interaction with a minor. But this argument that he was duped or fooled, especially because it came out that he cannot read or write, I think that's a defense that some people are kind of raising an eyebrow to as to whether or not it will actually work. Yeah, there's a lot of trial left. We know you're going to be following it for us. We'll have you back on the show. Brian Buckmeyer, thanks so much. My pleasure. Thank you. And still ahead here on Prime, the runway closed after the wings of two planes clip. The investigation into Britney Spears, could it impact her conservatorship battle? And Elon Musk announces he plans to make humanoid robots. We're going to take a look at what he's thinking by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day from Dictionary.com on the short stint of Mike Richards as host of Jeopardy. We're going to have more on his resignation coming up. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I hug you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. Right now, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week with George the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Welcome back. Now we take a look to the future. Tesla CEO Elon Musk announced he's building a humanoid robot that he says will do dangerous, repetitive, and boring tasks for us. And if you're worried about a robot apocalypse, Musk assures us that his creation will be friendly and navigate a world that's built for humans. We'll see about that. First, let's take a look by the numbers. The Tesla bot will measure five foot eight inches tall, weigh in at about 125 pounds, and be able to carry 45 pounds or deadlift 150 pounds. It will move at five miles per hour, which Musk says means you could actually run away from it, and if necessary, most likely overpower it. So I guess that's a little bit reassuring. The robot will have a computer screen for a face and use Tesla's autopilot system with eight cameras to help it navigate. 2022, next year, is when the company expects to complete the prototype. Earlier this week, we showed you these two robots from Boston Dynamics that flawlessly completed for the first time this complex obstacle course. Musk says his humanoid robot could be able to pick up bolts and attach them to cars with a wrench or go to the store for a grocery run. 
He says he expects this technology to have profound implications for the economy, those are his words, and could actually replace some workers. And still ahead, we have a ton to get to here on Prime. The tireless efforts to get members of an Afghan all-girls robotics team out of that nation. And the investigation into the criminal underworld of cheetah trafficking. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. News now and America this morning. The best new video. The breaking news overnight. Emergency crews called to the town of Surfside. U.S. airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria. The stories people are talking about. If you don't want to shave your legs? Don't. I was gonna say. Oh my. Got it. And what to expect in the day ahead? ABC World News now and America this morning. Starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Right now, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week with George the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. This is what being live is Three all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people this squeezing into this, this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. Thousands still waiting outside the gates, where Taliban fighters rule the streets. Nearly 6,000 U.S. troops now guarding the airport. Tonight, ABC News confirming there were no U.S. flights out of Kabul for up to seven hours today because the airbase in Qatar was filled to capacity. They're saying that they don't have enough room over there. Late today, we've learned rescue flights have now resumed, diverted to other locations. U.S. officials say 5,700 people have been evacuated in the last 24 hours, including hundreds of Americans, 13,000 thousand in all since Saturday. Any American wants to come home, we will get you home. And late today, after the president spoke, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin acknowledging with lawmakers that there have been instances of the Taliban beating Americans trying to get to the airport in Kabul, calling the situation unacceptable. And Pentagon spokesperson John Kirby acknowledging there have been reports of some Americans unable to pass through checkpoints. And it turns out last month, a U.S. embassy employee sent a classified cable to the State Department predicting the Afghan and government could soon collapse. Still, President Biden insists his team did not believe the Taliban would take over so quickly. 
People in New England are bracing for their first direct hit by a hurricane in 30 years. Henri, now a tropical storm, is barreling toward the northeast coast. Hurricane warnings and watches are already up across much of the northeast at this hour. Hurricane conditions likely in the next 36 hours. Expected to strengthen as it, as it gets past the Gulf Stream and then rapidly head towards Long Island. Connecticut is a Category 1 storm landfall Sunday afternoon and then drifting into uh, New England. With all this, all the impacts are going to come in. Strong storm surge up to 5 feet, rip current Yes, heavy rainfall and certainly damaging winds. We could see rainfall up to 10 inches well inland, so at the very least inland areas will see flooding. News tonight about an accident on the tarmac at Hollywood Burbank Airport. Two planes clipping wings while on the ground. No one on board the American Airlines and Alaska Airlines planes at the time. The American Airlines plane was being towed to a terminal when their wings made contact. One runway had to be closed for an investigation, causing some delays. A mystery in the mountains of California. To my knowledge, I've, I've been here 20 years and I've never seen an incident like this before. An entire family found dead on a hike in Mariposa County. No signs of trauma. The sheriff says it's possible an algae bloom killed them. I know there's been some speculation and we haven't confirmed that, but there are signage from the Forest Service regarding a uh, algae bloom. There's some signage up there of that, that could be poisonous, but at this point, you know, we can't rule anything out. Just nine days after being named one of the two new hosts of Jeopardy, Mike Richards abruptly quitting the job after reports of past sexist and offensive comments surface. A fun final Jeopardy category. Richards, who's also the show's executive producer, filled in as a guest host earlier this year. He's now apologizing for jokes he made about women, the homeless, and Jewish people, among others, on his podcast seven years ago, following a report on the website The Ringer. A brand new car! In addition, while producing The Price is Right, Richards was named in discrimination and harassment lawsuits from models on the show. He has denied any wrongdoing and was eventually dropped from the suit naming him a defendant. Richards saying the allegations do not reflect the reality of who I am. The Ever Given ship, which blocked the Suez Canal for six days in March, made its way safely through this time. It was the first time back since it left Egypt after the incident, which caused a traffic jam in the narrow waterway, disrupting global trade. Roughly 15% of the world's shipping traffic passes through the Suez Canal. Next to Britney Spears, who is under investigation tonight after an employee filed a complaint with police. As you know, the pop star is already embroiled in a lengthy conservatorship battle with her father. Kaylee Hartung has more. Britney Spears center stage in a new battle. The pop star now under investigation for alleged battery. There was a dispute between Miss Spears and one of her employees. And the employee alleges that during that dispute, Miss Spears struck her. The Ventura County Sheriff's Department confirming deputies responded to the singer's home Monday morning after receiving a call from someone who works there, telling ABC News the employee wasn't injured. The altercation first reported by TMZ, detailing that Brittany allegedly slapped a longtime housekeeper's phone out of her hands. This was not an emergency response. No, no, there was no active uh, physical engagement going on in, at, at, at the point that she called. Brittany's attorney calling the story overblown, sensational tabloid fodder. The former federal prosecutor telling ABC News it's nothing more than a he said, she said regarding a cell phone with no striking and obviously no injury whatsoever. Anyone can make an accusation, but this should have been closed immediately. This came out because of who she is, but in the grand scheme of things, it's extremely minor. Brittany posting this photo to her Instagram just as the news broke, writing, she obviously wants privacy. This unfolding just days after the 39-year-old got a big win in her fight to gain freedom from her father's control. Jamie Spears agreeing to step down as the conservator of her estate as part of an orderly transition once certain conditions are met. And if law enforcement didn't see injuries, all they can do is go on the word of their complaining witness. And I don't see that uh, impacting the conservatorship proceedings at all. If through an investigation, more facts come to light um, and, uh, you know, and we learn more about this, hypothetically, it could impact the proceedings. And Phil, we've reached out to the accuser, but we haven't heard back. The sheriff's department telling me they have spoken to all involved parties. Yes, Brittany was home when authorities arrived, but they'll take that investigation, hand it over to the district attorney. It's then up to the DA to decide if misdemeanor charges are warranted here. Phil. Kaylee Hartung, thank you.
Joining me now is the executive editor of the Animals Desk at National Geographic, Rachel Bale, who recently wrote an article titled, How Traffic Cheetah Cubs Move from the Wild into Your Instagram Feed. Definitely catches your attention. Rachel, thanks so much for coming on the show tonight. Thanks for having me. So you've been reporting on wildlife crime and exploitation for the last six years, and you have a new investigation out exposing one of the largest smuggling routes for cheetah traffickers in the world. Tell us a little bit about your report and what you discovered. Yeah, so cheetah cubs are in demand in the Persian Gulf, where they're bought as pets for the wealthy. And cheetahs don't really breed well in captivity. There's no commercial trade in them by law. And so if you want a pet cheetah, it's got to come from the wild. So what we discovered was this um, network from the Horn of Africa that brings cheetahs out of Africa and over to Yemen, where they are distributed to buyers all across the Gulf. Well, we know from your report that the cheetah trade is concentrated in the Horn of Africa. Where are these cheetahs going once they're taken? And are there any laws in place to prevent this kind of illegal trade? Yeah, the cheetahs are taken, mostly they seem to go out of Somaliland and over to Yemen because it's only a couple of hours by boat between the two. And then from Yemen, they're sold to Saudi Arabia, the United, em uh, United Arab Emirates, and other countries like that. The, there definitely are, there's an international treaty called CITES that makes it illegal or against international law to do this kind of transportation and trade. But, you know, it's, it's a very difficult thing to enforce, and clearly the trade is still happening. So most of our viewers right now might be surprised to hear this statistic. There are only about 7,000 adult cheetahs in the world, and they are currently listed as vulnerable by the International Union of Conservation of Nature. If something doesn't change here, are cheetahs in danger of being wiped out completely? Absolutely, because this is not the only threat cheetahs face. Cheetahs are also threatened by habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, conflict with humans, and Although the black, the black market, we don't really know how many cheetah cubs are being taken out of the wild each year. Some estimates put it as high as a couple hundred. So if you think about it, there's only 7,000 adult cheetahs left in the wild. If you have a couple of hundred cubs being taken each year, on top of all of the other threats that cheetahs face, that's a serious problem. Yeah, it seems like an urgent threat. There seems to be a fascination with these cheetah cubs, specifically as we're scrolling through our Instagram feeds and possibly liking these photos on other social media platforms. Why should people who aren't thinking about this, who didn't dive into it like you did, why should people care about what's going on there? Yeah, look, so nobody's going to deny cheetah cubs are cute. They are, in my opinion, some of the cutest big cat cubs there are. Um, and that's part of why they're in demand. But this desire to have them as sort of a status symbol to show off on Instagram is what's driving the illegal trade. So each time somebody likes a photo of somebody with their pet cheetah, you know, maybe the cheetah's in front of a fancy car or on a boat or sitting with somebody's, you know, pet lion and tiger as well. Every time you like or share a photo like that, you're opening it up to a larger audience and that in turn increases demand even more for cheetah cubs. So what people need to do, what we're asking people to do is to think just a little bit, think before they like those types of photos and spread them to a larger audience. Yeah, I mean, I have to be honest, I've seen pictures like that and never gave a thought to uh, how they get there, where they come from. So this is, this is really good uh, information. There has been more talk since the show Tiger King about using big cats for entertainment. Cheetah cubs, as you point out, are adorable, but not meant to be pets. Tell us a little bit about the why we should think before you like social media campaign. And actually, what's the goal there? You alluded to it, but what are you trying to get mm -hmm. done? Yeah, absolutely. So when it comes to wildlife crime, there's not a lot your average person can do to help stop it. It's in large part an issue of law enforcement, political will, international cooperation, things like that. But one thing everybody can do is help not spread demand. When we see photos of people you know, when we see photos of our friends or influencers or anybody on Instagram, TikTok, wherever, and they are cuddling with a tiger cub or they're, you know, posing with a cheetah, it looks fun. It's exotic and it's exciting and the animals are cute. We want to do that. But 
Those are the types of activities that drive the illegal trade. So if you don't like and don't share those photos, you help prevent them from spreading to a bigger audience, which in turn helps prevent demand to prevent trafficking. Think before you like. It's a good message, especially here. Rachel Bale, thank you so much. Thank you. And still to come, how one couple paid off $200,000 in debt in just 18 months, and it all began actually with one of them losing their jobs. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Good job. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Next to the couple who paid off $200,000 in debt in just 18 months. If you're thinking it's because they started making a lot of money, you'd be wrong. Rebecca Jarvis has more. When Karen Apcan lost her job in 2019, she and her husband Sylvester didn't have any savings to fall back on. All of a sudden that contract ended and then things just like went downhill from then. With a hefty mortgage and bills piling up, the Apcans owed about $110,000 in student loans and another $90,000 for their car, timeshare and other debts. So they decided to take some creative steps. In order for us to hit our goals, we had to make a drastic change, and that drastic change would be like to completely eliminate that house payment. They sold their house, paid a portion of their debts, and used the rest of the money to buy an RV, where they've been living with their eight-year-old son, Aiden, for the last 14 months. Come check out my room. He just adjusted so well. He loves being on the road, loves meeting friends, loves visiting new states and countries and everything in between. The Apcans needed a new way to make money. They poured their energy into their travel blog, themomtrotter.com, where they give tips on traveling, parenting, and homeschooling on a budget. Well, now was the time to kind of make this work and get better at my craft and kind of make it into a family thing so that it would be able to sustain us. Partnering with brands like Nature Valley, Circle K, and Crate and Barrel, they increased their brand's annual gross profit from $50,000 to $318,000. You know, I like got better at a craft, at, at photography and video and all that stuff, and 
pitching and reaching out to brands and just the income just started coming in. The extra money ultimately helping them clear over $201,000 in debt in just 18 months. I was able to sleep better just knowing that I don't have that debt over my shoulders anymore. This is home for us. The Afghan girls robotics team made international headlines you might remember about four years ago when they came just a few blocks from the White House for a competition. Most members of the team were born after the Taliban were ousted from power. We are thrilled to report tonight that 10 members of the team are in Qatar at this hour. We are joined by the team's founder, Roya Makbu, and Kim Motley, an American attorney who has been assisting the team. Thank you both so much for taking the time to join us tonight. Roya, let's begin with you. We all want to know, how are these 10 girls doing right now? They are safe. They are happy. Uh, right now, they are in uh, Qatar, and uh, they are uh, preparing for the um, their further education as well, uh, getting prepared for the competition. That is good to hear. Kim, you've, you've worked as a lawyer in Afghanistan and in the United States. I, explain to us what Afghans are now facing, not just the team trying to get out. Well, I mean, um, Afghans are facing a lot of uncertainty. A lot of people are extraordinarily scared, um, particularly women and girls. Um, you know, they just don't know what tomorrow brings. And that's why, frankly, we're, we're very grateful to the Qatar government for, you know, allowing the 10 girls and, and being really um, just rock stars when it comes to that. But there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear with what tomorrow brings. And Kim, there are about 50 more girls studying at the robotics school. Do you anticipate more will be able to leave Afghanistan at some point? Well, I think in terms of going forward, it's about trying to figure out how to best protect the girl, girls moving forward. So certainly the girls want to continue to be educated. They certainly want to continue to um, proudly represent Afghanistan. And so we're looking at, you know, different options of sort of what this new normal looks like in Afghanistan and also beyond Afghanistan. New normal, indeed. Roya, there are 27 million people under the age of 25 in Afghanistan. Do you believe the Taliban, when they claim girls will be allowed to continue uh, to study and to work already? We're getting reports out of Afghanistan that they will allow girls to be educated up until the age of nine and not after that? Well, I mean, we have here that they are allowing the girls to go to the schools, and they also promise that the, uh, they will allow the women to go to the university as well and back into the world based on the Sharia law. I mean, uh, the everything is so just very fast changing, and uh, we are trying to see what will be happen. Let's see uh, if they are uh, doing the promise that they are giving. But I think that uh, 27 million generation, young generation are deserve a better future, and we should not give up on them. They deserve to pursue the life they are looking for, especially young women in Afghanistan that uh, right now they achieve so many things after 20 years. We have so many of these young women that they are in politicians, they are uh, a doctor, engineers, businesswomen, and uh, they, are, they are an artist. So they deserve to, to pursue the life they are looking for. And, uh, and I hope that uh, now is a time for us to get united. And uh, after this change that has happened, that uh, making sure that uh, Taliban be accountable on the promises that they gave, and hopefully that uh, we have a peaceful society. Yeah, well, I think you're not alone. Certainly the world is watching and waiting to see if the Taliban will keep their promise. Kim, you've been helping resettle people from conflict zones for years now. What's the future look like for the girls who do get to leave? Well, I think what's really important, what needs to happen right now is true diplomacy. I mean, right now, the lead the world leaders need to insist that there be some type of quick summit that can be got that can be gotten together within a couple of days with the leaders of this new Afghan government as well as the Afghan women leaders and these this summit should be held in Doha with the backing of the international community there needs Needs to be real, like negotiations. The, the, world, the Afghan women leaders are ready to negotiate what women's rights should look like, what human rights should look like. And frankly, you know, Afghan women are not one-dimensional. They are an economic powerhouse. So if this new government in Afghanistan refuses, just basically chooses to not have Afghan Afghan women go to school or to continue to work, then it will crush this economy. And the fact of the matter remains that whether there's military troops in Afghanistan or not, the world is going to still be dealing with Afghanistan. And this is a time for the international community to back, really back up Afghan women, back up having some type of summit in Doha, and the international community can 
hold their foot to the fire by basically giving conditional aid. That if this new government does not choose to follow basic women's rights, basic human rights, and also the economic growth of Afghanistan and the country of Af Afghanistan, they can give consequences of those con of that conditional aid. And that's what should be happening right now. In addition to the UN, should be allowing Afghan women to have real seats at the UN table right now. These are things that should be happening right now and next week. And these are things that have to happen because at some point, like you said with your question, we have to think about the future of Afghanistan. And the reality is, is that there's going to be millions and millions of women that are going to remain in the country that, you know, deserve our protection. And finally, Roya, just quickly, what do the girls who were able to make it out and get to Qatar want to do next? So, the idea, I mean, first of all, thank you to Qatar that providing this um, transportation and to help the girls to get to the Doha safely. Um, what we are uh, trying to do is that I think that the girls right now are trying to get preparation for the competition for first global. They, because of the conflict and uh, the war, they paused and they, they couldn't continue. And now we are hope that they will be able to um to com uh, complete the competitions and hopefully they go to the schools that they are dreaming of that and they can pursue the field that they are like. And hopefully one day they can back to the country and be part of the rebuilding, Af rebuilding again Afghanistan. Right. Well, wishing and hoping the best for the remaining members of the team and everyone in Afghanistan tonight. Kim Motley, Roy Makhlu, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. And before we go tonight, the image of the day, this Marine pictured giving water to a young child, or this image of a Marine carrying another, a reminder of the incredible acts of compassion our service members often perform in the toughest of circumstances. That's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks for streaming with us. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts.